take our Bibles out now and let's turn to the 8th chapter of the book of Daniel. It took us long enough to finish Daniel chapter 7, didn't it? Amen. <laughs> oh, y'all want to spend some more time there? We can go back if you want to. I can go back. <laughs> no, we spent quite a while there. We're in the 8th chapter now this morning. And uh, in the first, you know, it's, it's interesting about Daniel. The first six chapters, you learn a lot of the history about Daniel and his three friends and, and the nation of Judah and the, the nation of Babylon. You, you learn a lot of history about things that happened there. But from everything that we learned there, everything we saw in those first six chapters, the thing we see is that God took perfect care of Daniel and his friends through it all. Can you say God takes care of us? Amen. God took perfect care of them. And he blessed them in great ways. But not only that, he used them. Do you want God to use your life? Do you want God to use you in your life for his glory? He used them from the time that Jerusalem was conquered through, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's concentration camps, his retraining programs that he put these boys through. These men kept their faith. They remained loyal to God above all. And God brought them safely through the fiery furnace. God brought Daniel safely through the lion's den. And God used Daniel and his three friends to shine the light of his love in a very dark, wicked world. They shine the light and love of their almighty God. And you know what? The world was not able to change these men. But rather, God used these men to change the hearts of kings and to change the world forever. And so we have the record of it. And Daniel 1 through 6, the first half of the book of Daniel was mostly historical. We saw all kinds of things there. But for the last few weeks, we made our way through Daniel chapter 7. But what we're going to see in Daniel 7 through 12 is going to be much more prophetic. 7 through the 12th chapters are much more prophetic. In other words, Daniel 1 through 6 tells us about the past. Daniel 7 through 12 tells us about the future. Anybody worried about the future? <laughs> you don't have to be. Most of this was Daniel's future, but there are parts of it. Some of these events are still yet to come in our future. If you want to know what's going to happen, you can study this book. Back in Daniel 2 and back in Daniel 4, God gave two dreams to Nebuchadnezzar, which Daniel had to explain to him. Nebuchadnezzar could not understand, but the Lord revealed the meanings to Daniel. It was through much prayer. It was through seeking God the Lord revealed the meaning of those dreams to Daniel, and he was able to interpret those dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. But once we got into chapter 7, last Sunday, or the last few Sundays in chapter 7, we see that it wasn't until chapter 7 that God finally gave Daniel a prophetic vision of his own. And in that vision, God showed Daniel the future kingdoms of the world that would rise to power both in his time and after his time, the, the, the nations that would rise up and would conquer other nations, those nations were, were symbolized and, and represented by animals and beasts. And th these nations would war and do violent things to try to hold on to control of power. And right in the middle of it all was Israel. These nations would rule over Israel through all that time, all the way until the time of Christ's return. Of course, we saw over the last few Sundays the final kingdom of man on this earth. We talked about that final kingdom of man. We're going to see that kingdom again and again in the book of Daniel. The worst, most wicked kingdom that will ever exist. The worst kingdom of man on this planet that will attempt to hold on to control over Israel is what Daniel saw in his vision as the little horn. He saw that little horn, or what we would call the kingdom of the Antichrist. Antichrist is coming, and that's going to be a terrible time on this earth. The most violent, terrible time on this earth. There's never been a time like it. There will never be another time like it. All the power of all the kingdoms of this world. This is going to be the most powerful, the most violent, the most wicked. It's going to be Satan's last attempt at holding on to power and defying Almighty God. But in the end, we saw 
through Daniel's vision that Christ is going to return in glory. Amen? And all the power of all the kingdoms of this earth are going to be given into his hand. He's going to rule on his throne as king of kings and lord of lords forever and ever. Amen. As we come to Daniel 8 this morning, we're going to see that the Lord has given Daniel now a second vision. This is the second vision that God gave personally to Daniel. We get to verse 1, and Daniel says that. He says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, the last king to rule over the Babylonian Empire, in the third year of his reign, a vision appeared to me. To who? To me, Daniel. After the one that appeared to me the first time, the one we saw back in chapter 7. God gave Daniel a second vision here. So we get an idea of the timing here that God gave that first vision that we studied back in chapter 7 the last few weeks. He gave that back to Daniel back in the first year of Belshazzar's reign, the son of King Nebuchadnezzar, the wicked son, the foolish son of King Nebuchadnezzar. That was in the first year of his reign that Daniel saw that first vision. And so this is three years later. This is the third year of Belshazzar's reign. Now that, uh, that uh, he's been there three years, now what we're going to see in this vision has some similarities to what we saw in Daniel's first vision back in chapter 7. It also has some similarities to what we saw in the first vision that Daniel explained to Nebuchadnezzar back in Daniel chapter 2. But the thing we're going to see that's different in this vision is that the Lord's going to show Daniel some more detailed insight into the coming Antichrist. And it's going to take us a little time to get there, that, that Antichrist who's coming. It's going to take us a little while to get there. We're going to kind of look at the kingdoms of the other kingdoms of this world this morning. But here's the tricky part about when we get to the kingdom of the Antichrist over the next couple of weeks. The tricky part we have to understand is that the Lord is going to show us the things about this coming Antichrist, not through a vision of that final Antichrist himself, like it was in Daniel's first vision, the little horn himself. But this time we're going to see the things, we're going to learn things about that coming Antichrist through another ruler that's going to raise up, a very wicked ruler who has already come to this earth in the spirit and the power of Antichrist. We know that in the Old Testament, you know, there was the prophet Elijah. And when John the Baptist came, you know, they asked him, because it says in, in, in the prophets that John, before the, the, the great and terrible day of the Lord, Elijah would come. And they asked John if, if he was Elijah. He, he, and he told them he came in the spirit and power. Jesus said that he, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, if you will receive it. And we're going to see... In history, a man who came in the spirit and power of the coming Antichrist. We're not going to see him today, but we're going to see that in weeks to come. We're going to learn from that man a lot about what Antichrist is going to be like. Now, that's confusing. Just hang on, because that's how we're going to see it play out. And when Daniel saw it, he didn't understand it either. He had to ask questions, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to ask the right questions so that we can understand What's going on? But to put it simply, we're going to learn about a very wicked king who the final Antichrist is going to be very much like. I think that he's much like Nebuchadnezzar was in the beginning. He wanted to be worshipped. I think he's going to be very much like a man that we're going to talk about. His name is Antiochus, and we'll talk about him next week as we get there. But what we're going to do now is we're going to start looking at Daniel's vision this morning here in chapter 8, his second Vision. So look with me at Daniel chapter 8, verse 2. And the first thing we're going to notice today is in this vision is we're going to see that the Lord foretold the defeat of Babylon. That's the first thing we see in this vision. The defeat of Babylon is foretold here in Daniel's vision. So look at verse number 2. Daniel says, I saw in the vision, and so it happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Uli. Um, I'm not calling you a liar saying Uli, the river was called Uli. 
And he was in a place, Daniel here, understand as he's, he's describing this to us, he is still living in Babylon. It's the third year of uh, Belshazzar's reign. And so Daniel still has about 11 years before Belshazzar dies. He's going to still live in Babylon. But he finds himself about, in this vision, 200 miles away off to the east. Finds himself about 200 miles away from Babylon in a city, the palace really in the citadel called Shushan, not Shushine, but Shushan. He's there in Shushan, the palace. The funny thing about that, Shushan wasn't really much of a place at this point. Um, but this is kind of prophetic of what's going to happen in Shushan. But Shushan later becomes a seat of power in Persia. We see that in the book of Esther. And we see that in a few other places in the Bible. But he finds himself about 200 miles east of Babylon in the city of Persia called Shushan. He's standing out there by the river Uli, which was really, it was really just a man-made canal that they took off another river and they wrapped it around the east side of the city, kind of like they've done in San Antonio. They brought it through the city. They brought this one around the east side of the city to bring water around that side, and it wrapped all the way around the east side and came back, flowed back into the river on the other side. And so Daniel's standing there on the east side of Shushan, out there by that Uli, really the canal there in Shushan. He's looking back toward the west, overlooking the city of Shushan. And he's really looking back in the direction of Babylon, about 200 miles west. He's looking back in the direction of Judah, which is his home, about a thousand miles west. And so this is kind of where he's at in his vision. And then God shows him something. In verse 3 it says, Then I lifted my eyes and I saw, and there standing by the river was a ram. It was not a Los Angeles ram. There are no Los Angeles rams in the Bible, right? But uh, he saw a ram. Remember in both Nebuchadnezzar's vision and uh, both of his visions that there were animals that represented nations. And it's the same thing we have here. He looks and he sees a ram. And so we can just kind of begin to think about the fact that this, is, this represents a nation here in Daniel's vision. There was a ram. And uh, this represented a nation that would rise up. In, in Daniel's vision, these were nations that would rise up and conquer. And this is the first one he sees. And then God shows him something else. Second part of verse 3, he says, standing, He's standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. On top of that ram, on his head, there were two horns. The horn, two horns were, were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. As we can look at the imagery here, and we can see that this is pointing us to the Medo-Persian Empire. We look at the imagery and we can tell that. We've already seen back in, in uh, Daniel's first vision because the Persians became stronger than the Medes. We saw there, uh, we, we've seen that uh, a, a bear that was leaning up on one side. It was, it, was, it was two nations that came together and the Lord showed him a bear that was raised up on one side. And we see that same union of these two nations in the imagery of this goat with one horn raised up higher than the other. We can also identify this as the Medo-Persian Empire by looking at the geography because Shushan became a major seat of power where Xerxes, King Xerxes, or you may know him by another name that you see him in uh, the book of Esther, a king named Ahasuerus. Uh, that's where he ruled in Shushan the palace. It's where he put on his great feast. And so the imagery... And the geography here, uh, and the timing in the history. Everything here points to the fact that this is the Medo-Persian Empire being pictured here. Not to mention the fact, aside from all these things I'm telling you, that when we get through looking at these nations this week, next week we're going to look at the next section in, in chapter 8. Daniel's going to say, what is this? What's this goat with the two horns, one higher than the other? And the angel Gabriel is going to say to Daniel... This is Medo-Persia. This is the Medes and the Persians. 
And so the Bible's going to identify it. We don't have to do a lot of guesswork because Daniel's going to come back later and he's going to ask the question and the angel Gabriel is going to explain that to him that this is Medo-Persian. So for those of you who have looked at me during the first vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw and Daniel tell, you know, and I tell you that's Medo-Persian empire that's going to defeat Babylon. And uh, for those of you who said, how can you know that? You're just guessing at it. You know, uh, people are afraid, a lot of preachers are afraid of Bible prophecy. They don't want to talk about it. They, they just say, well, you just can't understand it, so you just, you're going to make mistakes. But when the Bible comes back and explains it and says this was the Medes and the Persians, you know, you don't have to avoid prophecy like you want to stay away from monkeypox, okay? But you can, uh, you can know that this is not that difficult when the Bible comes back and says it. The imagery of it, the geography of it, the timing of it, the history of it, and the fact that the Bible comes out, the angel Gabriel says, this is Medo-Persia. We're going to see that later. So what's going to happen here? This, this ram that has two horns, one higher than the other, this ram that represents Medo-Persia. Verse 4 tells us what he sees next. He says, I saw the ram pushing westward. Now what's west from the Shushan, from Medo-Persia? is Babylon. That's towards Babylon. It's pushing west towards Babylon. It's also pushing towards Judah. Judah's going to be under the shadow of that empire as well. It's also pushing northward and southward, so it's kind of going out in a, a fanned out direction. It's defeating all these nations like this. You know, it's, it's defeating any nation it comes about. He says, so that it's, it pushes, it's, I saw the ram pushing Westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, not even Babylon, but he did according to his will, and he became great. And so the message God's revealing to Daniel in this first part of his dream is a prophetic warning that the Medo-Persian Empire would rise up and defeat Babylon along with every other nation in its path. As Babylon falls to Medo-Persia, Israel is also going to fall under the control of the Medo-Persian Empire. That's what fits into Bible prophecy. Now, we've already talked about the history of all these things several times when we've gone through some of these other visions. You might be sitting here saying, Brother Chris, you've been talking about Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome. What does this all have to do with me? Let me tell you what it has to do with you. When God said in His Word that He would send another nation to defeat a nation, when He made that prophetic promise, and then it happened, what this means is that Bible prophecy is 100% true and reliable. And you can count on it. And so when God's Word tells you something, you ought to take it very seriously. You ought to take it very seriously. When I tell you today, when I read God's Word, I tell you that judgment is coming on the United States of America. I hope you'll take that very seriously. We've had warnings. We've been attacked. We've seen ourselves very vulnerable. We've seen ourselves very weak. We've seen our most innocent citizens hit not from a country outside, but from our youth within. Our nation is under the judgment of God. And we'd better get on our knees about it. I know that's not a happy message. But that's the truth of it. The thing is, God did plenty of warning here. You think about how many times God warned the people of Babylon that destruction was coming. That the Medes and the Persians were coming. God gave Nebuchadnezzar his first vision in the second year of his reign. Nebuchadnezzar reigned quite a while, 56 years. His son came after him, reigned 14 years. But Nebuchadnezzar had that vision in the second year of his reign. So it was almost 70 years that God warned before God sent the Medo-Persians, God began warning the Babylonians through the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's vision 
that Daniel gave to the king. There's a nation coming to bring judgment. And then God warned Belshazzar in the first year of his reign. And then God warned him again in the third year of his reign. You can't say that God wasn't warning. God always gives plenty of warning before he sends his judgment. And we ought to listen to it. We ought to pay attention to those warnings. Bible prophecy is absolutely 100% reliable because everything God said was going to happen here happened just like God said it would. And we saw that in Daniel 5 when God wrote it with his hand on the wall and Belshazzar's knees knocked together. He was so afraid. But the, the, the Persians came in under the wall that night and they seized control of the city and, divide, and, and divided the empire between the Medes and the Persians. And that night, Belshazzar, the king, was slain. Exactly what God said would happen, happened. And so we ought to pay attention to God's word. Amen? Second thing we see is that the defeat of Medo-Persia is foretold. Now maybe you could say, well, this, you know, this, is, this, this dream is foretold. You can't really say much about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Say, well, 70 years before it happened. Uh, but you could say, well, maybe, you know, maybe uh, Daniel was just looking at the political climate, saw Persia on the rise, and just made a good guess. Um, I don't think he really could have guessed what would happen 11 years from that time. But this is altogether different. Let's talk about something that's going to happen over 200 years from now. Right? In verse number 5, we see that uh, Daniel tells us more about his vision. He says, I was considering, as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west. And so he had already had a glimpse of the geography here, right here, in the, the story. A male goat comes from the west. The last time it was a ram coming from the east and defeating Babylon, coming from Medo-Persia and defeating Babylon. This time, there is a male goat coming from the west to defeat the Medo-Persian empire. It says here that in verse 5, it says, A male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole ground without touching the ground. Well, what's that? Well, that talks about Speed. You know what I think about when I, when I read that? It, it came across the surface of the ground without touching the ground. I'm thinking about speed. I think back to the Roadrunner and the Coyote, right? You remember that? Y'all remember the Roadrunner? You know, that was back when the cartoons were good, right? Back when you could drop a piano on a, on a Coyote's head and nobody got upset about it. It was just something that, and then they get up, you know, and they go, and they pop back into shape, you know. Right? That's the way cartoons should be. I thought about that because he's, he's zipping on down that road. Coyote's trying to chase him. He can't catch him. He never can outsmart that roadrunner. But he's zipping on down, down that road, that, that, that roadrunner, and his legs are moving so fast you can't even see. It's just a blur underneath him, right? It's just a blur. And that's, that's what I think about. It says he moves across the ground with, with great speed. The male goat... Without He moves across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. It says in verse 5, goes on in the last part of verse 5, it says, The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, this is speaking about the kingdom of Greece. Like I said, the history is going to bear that out because it was the Greek empire that came along and defeated the Medo-Persian empire. This is talking about the kingdom of Greece and this notable horn... When we talk about a horn, it's talking about the leader of that empire. I hope you're listening. It, it says this notable horn, it speaks of the king that ruled over him and his name. We, we know him as Alexander the Great. I don't think he was that great, but that's the name he's known by. Notice it says in verse 6, Then he came to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and read at, ran at him with furious power. That's Alexander the 
uh, brought his armies out to do battle against the armies of the Medes and the Persians. And he says, and I saw him, verse 7, I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground, trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. And we know this is speaking to us about Greece because for one thing, uh, you know, the history of it, the imagery of it matches what we see uh, back there in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the, the timing of it, the history of it. But for another thing, when we get a little further in Daniel chapter 8, the angel Gabriel is going to explain to Daniel when he asks him, what does this mean? He's going to explain a little further down in the text that uh, this is the kingdom of Greece. He's going to explain this is the Greek. It was the Greek empire. And so all the history behind it lines up, but then the angel Gabriel explains. So the Bible itself tells us this is the Greek empire. It was the Greek empire that rose to power, came up out of the west with their warriors covered from head to toe in bronze armor. They cut down the armies of the Medes and the Persians like grass. Uh, they, they couldn't defend themselves. They couldn't stop them along with every other army that they faced during their time. All right, so, so we have two things in history. Uh, Daniel's being shown hundreds of years into the future, uh, over 200 years in the future. But then we see something else is foretold. And that is, we see the death of Alexander foretold. See, the death of Alexander foretold. In verse number 8, Daniel says, Therefore the male goat grew very great. Right? You know that history tells us Alexander went on to conquer the whole world. And then he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. Right? They should have got that guy an Xbox or something to help him with his mind. But it says, when he became great, when he became strong, the large horn. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says great there. Alexander the great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And so it's interesting that uh, after he'd conquered the world, he didn't live much longer after that, that he got very sick very suddenly, and he died of a fever. He was very young, right, like 31, 32 years old. He just dropped dead. Alexander the Great. And so he had all the power in the world. He conquered everything, but he couldn't hold on to that power for very long, Right? And that goes for everything that you grab a hold of in this world. You know, you can hang on to it all you want, but you can't take it with you. Really? You know that? You cannot, you know, hearses don't pull U-Hauls behind them to take your stuff onto heaven with you. Or wherever else you might be moving to, to a warmer climate. He had all the power in the world, but he couldn't hang on to it, and he couldn't take it with him. And so his death is foretold. And then fourthly, the fourth thing we see here in the beginning of Daniel's vision is the division of Greece is foretold. This is the Greek empire was divided into four parts. We see in verse 8, it says, and in the place of it, in the place of that notable horn, that when, as soon as he became strong, that horn was broken, and in the place of it, four notable ones, four notable horns came up toward the four winds, to the east, the west, the north, and the south, all four directions, Four horns. And if you remember when we studied Daniel's first vision, Daniel chapter 7, the kingdom of Greece was represented by a leopard and it had four wings, right? And those four wings are the four generals of Greece that gave the ability for Greek, Greece to conquer the world so fast with such speed. But then it had four heads on that leopard and those represent the four generals because when Alexander died so suddenly... And he didn't leave a successor to the throne. You know, you don't plan to die when you're in your early 30s. But he died so suddenly and hadn't named somebody to rule in his place. And so they asked him, who's going to rule? And he said, give the kingdom to the strong, is what he said. And so they just took Alexander's four strong generals and they divided the kingdom into four parts. And each of those four generals ruled over a fourth part of Alexander's kingdom. And the word of God told us all this long before it happened. Gave Daniel a vision. And we're running out of time. We need to draw this message to a close. But as we do, let me just close by just saying this again about Bible prophecy. 
the perfect 100% reliability. God gave this second vision to Daniel in the third year of Belshazzar's reign, which was about 551 B.C. It was about 11 years later in 539 B.C. that the Medo-Persian army made their way into Babylon. They defeated the army of Babylon and they took control of the city and Belshazzar was slain. That was 217 years uh, after Daniel's vision. Uh, it, that the next thing happened when Alexander led the armies of Greece into Persia and defeated them. It was 228 years after Daniel's second vision when Alexander suddenly became very sick and he died of a fever. And then they divided the kingdom to those four generals. What's the point, you ask? No man could have ever guessed that all these things would be happening over 200 years from now. But God knew God knows what's going to happen 12 years from now. God knows what's going to happen 200 years from now. He knows what's going to happen 250 years from now. He knows what's going to happen 1,000 years from now. He knew because God knows the beginning from the end, and He knows what's going to happen. My point is you can trust God's Word. You can trust everything it tells you. And the two most important things the Bible tells you Two most important things the Word of God tells you. Number one, that Jesus Christ came and He died on a cross to save us from our sins. That's the most important thing He tells you. The next most important thing He tells you is that Christ, Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ, is returning one day in judgment as King of kings and Lord of lords, and you need to be ready to meet Him when He comes. We have an appointment with God. When He returns, we need to be ready to meet Him. That's my message today. And I want to close just with a passage from 2 Peter chapter 3. And I hope that maybe it will get you thinking about how important this all is. 2 Peter chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me. And I just want to read through this and then we're going to dismiss. But I hope that you'll understand when you hear the words of this book... I hope that you'll take them seriously. Because what this book says is true. It will happen. This is not something to take lightly. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible tells us scoffers will come. You know what a scoffer is? Somebody who doesn't believe the Bible. Somebody who makes fun of the Bible. It says scoffers will come. Have they come? There's a lot of them. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Is that happening today? They're doing whatever they just want to do, whatever they're burning and itching to do all throughout their body. They're walking in their own filthy, disgusting lusts. And they're proud of it all this month. We've got to watch this garbage on our children's programs. They're proud of it. Scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? You all believe in a Jesus who said He's coming back? Hadn't happened yet? We don't believe that. Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. I said, nothing's changed. The world just keeps on going. Jesus hasn't come back. Why should we believe He's coming back? Peter goes on, he says, For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. In other words, they forget that God is the creator of this world. They don't want you to believe God's the creator of this world. Your kids go to school and they try to tell them God didn't create it. They try to tell them that your children evolved from a monkey. Just because they act like a monkey doesn't mean they came from a monkey. They forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. God created the heavens and the earth, standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded by water. They're forgetting that God once flooded the earth because of the wickedness in the earth. God once flooded this entire planet and killed everybody, except for eight souls. Eight souls. 
Dead bodies floated all over the world. God destroyed this earth in His wrath because of its wickedness. And that's the story we put on baby's walls in the nursery. Beautiful. I'll help them go to sleep. God flooded the world. They forget God created the world. God flooded the world. He, said, he says this, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, in other words, the, the heavens that we look up, we see the skies, we see the sun, the stars, the moon, we, we see the earth we're standing on, it's preserved by the same word of God, the, power of, the same power of God's word that created it, it's holding it all together. That, that earth, the heavens where we live, it's now preserved by the same word, but it's also reserved for fire. It's reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. There's a fire coming, folks. And you didn't believe in global warming, did you? There's a fire coming, but man's hand is not on the thermostat. God's hand is on the thermostat. There's a fire coming. God's judgment is coming. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. Time makes no difference to him. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, that promise that he's coming back. He hadn't forgot about it. He's not got lazy about it. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. But his long-suffering toward us, you know what that means, long-suffering? He's patient with us, right? He is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why Christ hasn't come back yet. You say, where's the promise of His coming? Well, He hadn't come back because God is very patient and He doesn't want anybody to be lost and perish in hell for eternity. God loves people and God wants people to be saved. Do you understand that? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. So on that day, when everything that you see here is burned up, they're not going to be able to tell the difference between my credit card statements and all Mike's money that he has sitting over in the bank over there, it's all going to look like ash. It's all going to be the same. So all that stuff's not going to matter anymore. Right? It's all going to be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, that's the question. Therefore, since all everything, look up around you. All these things, this is what the Bible tells us. All these things will be dissolved. That's what the Bible's telling us today. And Peter says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You need to be ready for that day, my friend. What manner of persons ought we to be? And guys... Whatever excuse we want to give, it just doesn't work. There's nothing more important than this. Nothing more important. Be ready. Make sure your relationship is right with Jesus Christ. Make sure you know Him. Let's stand.